The dynamic range is the ratio between the weakest and the strongest of the returns coming back to the ultrasound probe. When these signals return to the probe, the processing software will apply a value to these where strong reflections are white, weak reflections are black, and medium reflections are some shade of grey in the middle. And the question for the software setup is, how many greys do you want? Graphically, the software running within the ultrasound machine will get a number of packets of energy coming back, which will all have different signal strengths, and there are a number of ways it can resolve these signals into a picture. In its simplest form, it could decide that half the signals coming back at the lowest signal strengths would all be coloured black as pixels on the screen, and the top 50% of signal strengths coming back would all be coloured white on the computer screen. This means that the pixels would only be black or white and would give an incredibly high contrast picture which would be useful for things like vascular scanning where you're just trying to differentiate between the inside and outside of a blood vessel. For a little more sophistication, the machine could decide that a third of the weaker signals will be black, a third of the more medium signals will be grey, and the top third of the stronger signals will all be white. So now we have a computer screen that's displaying exactly the same information, but in a different form, where pixels now have three colours rather than two. This would give you um, less contrast, but a bit more definition of some of the more complex tissues. The highest quality pictures come when the computer software gives the most variation in pixel colours to the strength of returning signals, such that in this example, the lowest seventh of the signal strengths coming back are colour-coded black, the top seventh of the signals coming back uh, are colour-coded white, and all the other signals are given varying shades of grey. This gives a low contrast picture which is a very high quality in terms of looking at soft tissues like tendons, uh, bone and nerves uh, because it gives the most differentiation between different tissue types. An interface between air and any other tissue will reflect everything and be um, colour-coded bright white. An interface with fluid will have most of the ultrasonic energy passing straight through and will be uh, seen as black. And all other tissues, as we've seen, uh, will offer different acoustic interfaces, offering different strength of signal returns, which will be coded different strengths of grey. The variety of software settings that are uh, available on ultrasound machines allow you to um, optimise your scan for different uh, scanning needs as seen here and you can adjust varying menu settings to give you the exam type that you wish um, the system set up in terms of and contrast when you're using the machine it's, it's important to get the background lighting correct get the screen angle at 90 degrees uh, to your face uh, in all planes so that it's not angled away from you and think about the orientation of the probe on the patient so you know where lateral, medial, uh, inferior and posterior are um, in relation to the patient and the screen and the way you're looking at the patient. In general you should set up before you go sterile to save you having to fiddle with the machine once you're sterile if you're doing a sterile procedure and the kind of things you should set up before you go sterile are in-scan settings, the gain, the depth, the frequency. And don't forget that the screen has a button that reverses left and right, and if that's been reversed on you without you realising it, it could cause a problem. Ultrasound probes are labelled using a combination of letters and numbers such that an L38 probe is a linear probe depicted by the L 
uh, and this has a 38 millimeter footprint uh, when applied to the patient. A C60 is a curvy linear probe, which in this case has a footprint of 60 millimeters, which would be most unsuitable for superficial scanning in the neck um, because it's designed to look too deep uh, and will be unwieldy when placed against the neck. Doppler is frequently used to detect the movement of blood within vessels uh, within the ultrasound image. The principle of Doppler is that a fixed frequency sound wave is fired at a moving target, uh, in this case red blood cells, and they return to the probe with a frequency shift. If the blood is flowing away from the probe, the frequency will decrease. If the blood is flowing towards the probe, it will increase. This colour power Doppler system can be non-directional, in which case all flow is depicted as orange, or directional. Directional colour power Doppler is colour coded such that blood flow away from the probe is coloured blue and blood flow towards the probe is coloured red. This allows you to differentiate between arteries and veins by adjusting the probe position uh, and has nothing to do with uh, oxygenation. Please bear in mind that if you are using Doppler, um, if the probe is cutting the blood vessel at 90 degrees, it's not very helpful because it won't be able to detect blood flow towards or away from the probe because it will be equal. So you need to angle the probe deliberately so the blood is either flowing towards the probe or away from it to make the best use of directional colour power Doppler. This means that the same blood vessel, such as the carotid artery, will appear red when the probe is pointing towards the heart, or blue when the probe is pointing towards the ear, with the blood now flowing away from the probe. Any system where you overlay uh, flow Doppler uh, signals on top of a 2D image is referred to as duplex scanning. Please note that with duplex scanning, the 2D image, image quality falls remarkably um, as the Doppler diverts processor use away from image production to um, Doppler information. So do not attempt to needle a patient or perform a block while you have the colour power Doppler switched on. By all means switch it on to check for blood vessels, but switch it off to improve the quality of the ultrasonic picture before needling the patient. One form of artefact to be aware of is post-cystic enhancement, where when ultrasound waves pass through uh, a fluid-filled structure, there's very little reflection from within the fluid-filled structure so there's an exaggerated echo from the um, distal part of the fluid fill structure which appears as a very white, bright um, echo underneath the structure. Uh, this is not a real structure, it is, it is an artefact. Peripheral nerves have a characteristic appearance where uh, they're essentially a lot of stroma and packing uh, around the uh, nerve fascicles which appear as little black dots which is why we get this typical appearance of peripheral nerves. Nerve roots uh, as in the interscalene brachial plexus and probably the lumbar plexus uh, are not so covered in stroma and packing um, and therefore would appear to be more, more vulnerable and certainly have a slightly different appearance. Please bear in mind that when using uh, ultrasound what you're producing is 2D images of a 3D structure so you need to be careful about orientation, you need to have a good sense of your 3D uh, anatomy and when scanning in real time have a very active hand uh, to give yourself a look from lots of different angles. The 
transducer beam is typically very thin um, so when you are using an ultrasound beam to get a picture and then manipulate a needle within the beam uh, you've got a very narrow area to operate in which requires uh, understanding and some practice. You'll need to move your hands quite a lot to build up a 3D picture of the structures you're interrogating and learn how to follow the needle tip both outer plane and in plane and see how the needle tip interacts uh, as it gets closer to the structures. You should pick uh, a needle length that's long enough to work around the probe. Um, often this will mean using a slightly longer needle than you think you need um, but the shorter needles will put your fingers much closer to the probe and make it more, more difficult. Approaching nerves with the needle out of plane is frequently more difficult than in plane. The ultrasonic beam is very thin. Here we can see the ultrasound probe in purple. The skin is coloured orange. The ultrasonic beam is turquoise. And the nerve is the white and purple checkerboard pattern. So here we have an ultrasound beam that's picked up the nerve. If we move away by a small amount in either direction, we will be unable to see the nerve because the beam is so thin. If the needle is approaching out of plane, we will not see the tip and the nerve in the same picture um, until the needle is very close to the nerve. So here we have an ultrasound picture of the nerve with no sign of the needle. If we angle our beam up towards the shaft of the needle we can now see the needle which appears as a white dot in the middle of the screen, but we've now lost sight of the nerve. If we move our beam down the shaft of the needle till we get just to the very tip, what we'll see with this picture is a double dot, which is the bevel of the needle, and this shows us where the tip of the needle is. So as the needle approaches the nerve, we are walking the beam on and off the tip to maintain a view of the tip. until eventually we get close enough to the nerve so that we can now see the double dot or bevel um, in close proximity to the nerve. Um, in order to do this, steeper approaches are better than flatter approaches because you have more of the needle within the very narrow beam. If we go past the nerve, we will see both the nerve and the very small dot within the picture. This is not very helpful because we have no idea where the tip is. All we can tell is that the shaft is going somewhere past the nerve. For in-plane approaches, um, it's much easier to see the whole length of the needle and the tip and the nerve uh, all in the same picture. Uh, so here we have the whole length of the needle, the tip as an arrowhead uh, and the nerve over to one side of the screen. Within plane approaches the two things that uh, help with this technique Firstly, the flatter the needle, uh, the better will be our picture and imaging uh, of the needle. So the flat approaches give a better view of the needle. Secondly, secondly, if we place our target nerve in the centre of the screen or more towards the needle entry point, 
we will force ourselves to have a much um, steeper angle to the nerve and also will not have much useful screen in which to see the nerve um, and needle uh, approximating. If we deliberately adjust our probe position so that the target nerve is now off to one edge of the screen, um, that will give us a more useful area of screen, a bigger area of screen to see the needle approaching and often facilitates uh, a flatter needle approach often from an entry point some distance from the, uh, from the probe contact with the skin. Finally, when approaching nerves it is advisable to approach to one side or the other for an outer plane approach and we'll inject local on both sides of the nerve uh, on this side and that side. Conversely, for an in-plane approach, we'll aim for the top and bottom of the nerve rather than aiming again for the centre of the nerve.